Now, in your Bibles today, I'd like for you to open them with me, please. I'd like to preach the fourth in this series of messages on the Word of God uh, to Luke chapter number 10. Luke chapter number 10, and uh, I have a thought here that the Lord has uh, given me that I believe will be a real help to you. Uh, In this story, Luke chapter number 10, we begin at verse number 38. The Bible said, Now it came to pass, uh, as they uh, uh, went, that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And uh, she had a sister called Mary, which uh, also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Now keep that in mind if you would. Verse number 40, But Martha was cumbered about much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, uh, dost thou not care that my sister uh, hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Now let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, would you help us today and use me for your glory today to help me to uh, help the people to get an appetite for the Word of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Probably the greatest thing that one of the greatest things our churches needs today is for men and women, boys and girls, young people and old people, to get an appetite again for the Word of God. Now, here we have a story of two sisters, Mary and Martha, and Jesus comes to their house. Now, Mary takes the attitude that she takes the opportunity that is set before her to sit and hear the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Martha takes the attitude that she wants everything just right, And there's nothing wrong with what Martha did by serving. But Martha missed a great opportunity by not hearing the Word of God. So Martha gets frustrated and comes to the Lord and said uh, to him, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? And Jesus rebuked Martha and called her name twice. And when you see uh, something doubled in Scripture, it's, it's very important that you stop and listen and pay attention to what is being said. And so uh, Jesus tells her that uh, Mary hath chosen that good part. He said, one thing is needful. And, you know, you and I need to do what is needful. Now, let me say that serving is great. Ministry is good. Getting things done is right. I think everybody ought to be busy. I don't think the ministry is a place for lazy people. And even you young people, while you're waiting on God to show you your life's plans, uh, you need to be busy. But let me just say that you can get too busy. And you can get too busy even in church work. One person cannot do all for the Lord. The Lord has shown me that over the years. I'm a fellow that I like to do everything. You remember Peter in the Bible in John, uh, in the Gospel of John, Peter after the resurrection and the Lord had corrected Peter about denying him Uh, Peter said, Lord, what shall this man do? You remember that? And the Lord basically told him, it's none of your business what what he does. Talking about the Apostle John. And their ministries were different. And so it's really none of my business what another man does. My business is that I need to be in the will of God. But one way that I can be in the will of God, the Bible says in Romans chapter number 12, by the trans." Uh, by the, by the uh, not be conformed, but by the transforming of my mind. And that deals with prayer and the Word of the Lord. When I read the Word of God, I will know more about the will of God for my life. Now, you must develop an appetite for the Word of God. Now, if you're full on the things of the world, uh, you're going to have to allow God to do some maneuvering in your life. Now, the Bible said in Proverbs 27, 7, The Bible said, The full soul loatheth and honeycomb, but to the hungry soul every bitter thing is sweet. Now, if a man is full, he's not going to want to eat as much, you see. And if you fill up on junk, junk food will fill you up faster than anything in the world. 
And I'm afraid today that we're filled on junk food in our churches more than we are the Bible. I'm not, and by the way, I'm for books. But I'm not nearly as interested in books as I am the Bible. In 1979, I was a young boy, about 12 or 13 year old. And I had a Bible, but I could not read that Bible. Now, because of my eyesight, we put a new pastor in in 1979. On a Wednesday night, was April the 18th, 1979, my pastor came and sat down beside me while the choir was singing. Now, usually I would sing in the choir. I don't know why I wasn't in the choir that night, but I wasn't in the choir for some reason. And the pastor said to me, Ricky, do you love me? I said, yes, sir. I was interested in him. I thought it'd be a new start for our church. I thought it'd be a new period. He was a young man. Uh, He was impressive. He had a a charisma about him in the right way. And I said, yes, sir. He said said to me the second time, Ricky, do you love me? I said, yes, sir, preacher, I do. And he said to me the third time, Ricky, do you love me? And I said, yes, sir, I do. And so uh, I, uh, as, as he handed me the first Bible that I could ever read, he handed it to me. The first Bible I could ever read was a giant print Bible. Now he said to me, one of the qualifications for you reading this Bible is you go home and read a chapter a day. Well, I went home and got my mama to start helping me read the Bible. I'll be honest, the flesh didn't like it sometimes. I'd have homework from school, always do my homework, and then I'd read my chapter in the Bible. Sometimes my flesh didn't like it. My mama would say to me, well, you got a short chapter tomorrow, only 25 verses or something. And then she'd say, well, you got a long chapter tomorrow. you got 50 verses to read. But reading that Bible gave me a thirst and a hunger for the Word of God. And before you know it, I was reading that Bible on my own. And before you know it, the Lord called me to preach. And can I say to you that over uh, 45 years later, I still, 46 years, however long it's been, 45 years, I still love my Bible. Now, friend, if, if you could get an appetite for the Word of God, just the Bible, it, 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 it would help you about what you believe. You know, many people today, it's all about what some preacher said. Well, this preacher said this, so it's got to be right. Let me tell you something. Every preacher that's ever preached in his life, every preacher has been off in some area. There is no perfect preacher. I want you to understand that. There's no perfect preacher. And instead of uh, worshiping the preacher, now, I'm, I believe in following the man of God. Don't believe in worshiping him. But I believe instead of making so much out of the preacher in, the, in, in, the, in this day and hour, we need to get back to getting in our Bibles for ourselves. We need to see what the Bible says to me and to you from the Word of God. Now, I want to give you some ways to do that. Number one, uh, meditate in your Bible. This is something that I don't really hear a lot of people doing, but get your, get your Bible out. And just get no commentary, no dictionary, no nothing. Just get your Bible and meditate in it. Read a verse and then sit back and say, Holy Spirit, what are you telling me to, today about this verse of Scripture? And I tell you, that'll be food for you for that day. And you will develop an appetite for the Word of God like you've never had. Let's read Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Now that's the promise to those that meditate in their Bible. That's the promise to those who get the Bible down and and meditate in it and find out what it's saying. As a young boy, God taught me a lot of what I know, and I don't know a lot. 
But God taught me a lot of what I know sitting under that old hickory nut tree, whatever that tree was in the backyard. I'd get me a Bible, and I'd sit there and read my Bible, and read my Bible, and read my Bible. And uh, I'd read it in the front yard. I'd read it in the back yard. I'd get in the old rocking chair, and I'd just move all over the yard and read my Bible. And I, I just want to say to you that uh, I was living in Paul Settle's rental house there on Little Elk and Church Road in Rhonda, North Carolina. And one day, about Christmas time, there's some people knocked on my door. And they said to me, Preacher, want to give you something. And they had been down to the furniture place in Elkin, North Carolina, and gave me a brand new recliner chair. And said, we saw you sitting in that old rocking chair reading the Bible, and we want to give you something. And brother, we used that, rock, that old that recliner for years. But I want to tell you something. Ladies and gentlemen, I was rewarded, I guess, for reading my Bible. I didn't read my Bible to get a brand new recliner. I read my Bible because I was trying to learn something. I was trying to know something from God's Word. And I look back on those days in my life, and those were precious days meditating in the Word of God. If you've never tried meditating in the Word, you'll try Now, Jesus said to Mary, He said, Mary hath chosen that good part. What was Mary doing? She was sitting at Jesus' feet. Now, when you sit at someone's feet in the Bible, it denoted humbleness. It denoted submission. But it also denoted learning. Paul said at the feet of Gamaliel, uh, the, the maniac was at Jesus' feet in Mark chapter number 5. And here Mary is at Jesus' feet, learning His Word. You see, the very Word of God was in her house. By the way, you have the very Word of God in your house. I'm talking to you today, and many of you have more than one copy of a Bible in your home. A Chinese man said the Chinese government came to him, and he was a doctor. And they said, uh, we will, uh, I think they disbarred him maybe from being a doctor. Uh, if, if you'll deny the Word of God, we'll let you go for it. He said, I'll not deny the Word of God. And for 25 years, he lived his life without a Bible. Now, brother, if you had to live your life without the Bible, uh, there'd be a void in our life. Now, in America, we've got it on our phones. We've got it in books. We've got it uh, on computers. Uh, a man the other night, I walked off the platform at church preaching. A man met me, and he said, Preacher, do you have the Bible on computer? And that man was going to give me a, a, a program on the computer. And let me tell you something, brother. Meditate in the Word of God. Meditate in it. Oh, if you just meditate in your Bible, amen, get in your Bible. And then, I want to say number two, not only meditate, but an appetite for the Word of God. Now, no doubt Mary was at Jesus' feet, and Mary heard the Word. But no doubt Mary went away, and I believe Mary probably pondered on what she heard. I think, number two, you ought to study your Bible. You ought to study the Bible. Now, studying is, is work. Studying is getting your concordance down. Studying is getting the commentary. But I, was, uh, I want to caution you. Be careful who you read after. These commentary writers are so weak. These commentary writers are so opinionated. These commentary writers add so much stuff to the Word of God. Now, I want to tell you, it's a sin to add to the Bible. Be careful how you add to God's Word. Be careful how you teach in a book that, uh, that, that something and then put it out and a crowd of preachers read it and go preach it and they're preaching false doctrine because the Bible didn't say that. You see, I believe every word in my King James Bible. First of all, I believe the Bible. That's the starting point. You've got to believe the Bible. I believe there is no other translation better than what I've got and that's the King James, the authorized King James Bible. And I've done some studying on, on all that and, 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 I, and I've, that's, the, that's, the, that's my translation. That's, that should be everybody's translation in, in America. But uh, I believe my Bible, I believe every word. Uh, you know, you could say to somebody, do you believe the Bible? Yeah, I believe the Bible. I believe every word in the Bible. But when you get to talking to them and you set them down and get to question them, you find out they don't believe a lot of the Bible. They say, oh, no, no, I don't believe it happened that way. If it happened this way, well, the Bible said it happened that way. The Bible said in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth is out form and void and darkness upon, was upon the face deep. That's real simple. I believe all that was at the same time. I don't think there's 10 billion years there between that. You want to create all these monsters and all this and that and other thing. People just take the book of Genesis, and I tell you, they, they, they make a mess out of it sometimes. I mean, brother, some of the things people come up with and believe. But if you'll take the Bible, the Bible's a good commentary on the Bible. Just I, I believe God created man. I don't believe I came from a monkey. 
Amen. I know where I came from. I was reading just a few minutes ago there in my office where God said He made the grass to grow, and I, I was thinking about that. I first started out a few years ago. I loved mowing my yard. Well, that thing got kind of old to me, and I sort of kind of got dreading mowing the yard. I just kind of dreaded it. But I'm getting where I like it again now. But I've grumbled a few times. Well, i got to go mow that yard. That grass is high again. I was reading this morning where God made the grass grow. And I thought about that, and I thought, you know, I shouldn't be grumbling about mowing that yard. Why, brother, that's God that makes that grass grow. But you need to study your Bible. And I'll tell you something. You need to know what you believe. Preachers, you need to know what you believe. And I believe the same thing I did 40 years ago. And I'm preaching the same thing I preached 40 years ago. God's not going to give you a new take on things. There's, there's, if, you, if you're one of these fellows, you've got to always have something different. Listen, I don't have to have something different. I just preach the Word. I preach the Bible the way it is. I don't, I don't need But listen, you can get new truths that you've never seen before. The Bible said in Psalm 119, 18, Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. You know, I believe we'll get back to letting the Holy Spirit be our teacher. We rely so much on man teaching us the Bible. Well, brother so-and-so said this, and brother so-and-so said that, and brother so-and-so said this. I want to ask you a question. Were they filled with the Spirit when they wrote that? Well, I don't know. I wasn't there. Well, there you go. But the Bible will never change. You can take a chapter in the Bible. Take John 14. And read that entire chapter for 30 days and make you some notes on something that stands out to you, just a thought that might stand out to you on day one. Day two, you'll get another thought. Day three, another thought. Day four, another thought. Day five, you know why? This Bible lives. The book of Hebrews said that this Bible is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. That's what it said. Oh, could you get an appetite to study your Bible? You see, when you study it for yourself, you'll know what you believe. I know what I believe about eternal security. I've studied it. I know what I believe about doubting my salvation because I've studied that. In my early days, I was doubting. I know what I believe about marriage because I've studied the Bible. I know what I believe about the church and about missions and about giving and tithing because I've studied the Bible. And I've come too far down the road to let some man change my mind on that. Somebody said, well, so-and-so showed me this in the Bible. Who was he a hundred years ago? Think about that. If this Bible was good a hundred years ago, it's good now. The things we believed a hundred years ago, we ought to be believing now. The things fundamentalists taught a hundred years ago, we ought to be teaching now. But we've let people come up with new doctrine. Oh, but they've seen it different. They've seen No, they ain't. The Bible never changes. My friend, we ought to study it. But you ought to know why, if you're a fundamental Baptist, you ought to know why you're Baptist. See, I know why I'm Baptist. Did you know it may surprise you, but I'm not Protestant. Now, when I went to school, they said, you're either a Catholic or you're Protestant. I'm neither. I don't identify with the Catholic Church. I don't identify with the Protestants. I'm not. I'm neither. I didn't protest anything. I didn't come out of anything. The Baptists did not come out of any other organization. We all, you trace us back to the original ones, John the Baptist and the Apostle Paul. We're Baptists. Now, that don't make me better than you if you're not a Baptist. No, sir. That don't make me better than you. You, you say, well, preacher, can I be some other denomination and be saved? Absolutely. But I'm just simply telling you, I know who I'm. I know about the King James Bible because I've studied. I have no problem. I would not. I'm not going to debate that with you. Now, I would help somebody if if they didn't know why the King James was the Word of God. I'd help you about that. But I'm not going to debate it with you. You know, I have a certain way I dress. Well, I get it from the Bible. I don't get it from some preacher. I get it from the Holy Ghost and the Bible. The Holy Spirit will never lead you contrary to the Holy Scriptures. I told you many years ago, my uncle Johnny. And he's, 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 he's gone now. He's, he had a testimony. He loved the Lord, and, and he was a deacon in the church. And, and I did uh, Michael Johnny's funeral, and I, 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 I love my Uncle Johnny. Me and him were close buddies. And my Uncle Johnny, when we was just kids, he took us up the river, let us play around the water up there. We would playing around the water. I hadn't been saved but a few months. I'd gotten saved in the winter and his springtime, summertime, sometime during that year. And the Holy Ghost said to me, Son, what are you doing up here dressed like that? I never did go back up there dressed like that again. And then I found in the Bible where a man ought to be holy and a man ought to be right. Now, the Bible's not a list of rules and do's and don'ts. But you ought to study the Bible. There's, there's not a doctrine in the Bible. Somebody said doctrine divides. Well, you're wrong about that. Doctrine unites. You take a church that don't have any doctrine, they'll be divided. You take a church that don't know who they are and they got a, on their sign, they don't know what they are, they don't identify with anything, just come as you are and leave as you came, well, they're the ones divided because they don't know what they believe. 
You see, I you see, I don't debate the Bible. I don't get into Bible debates. I don't I don't you write me a letter and I write you one, you write me one, and I write you one. I just don't do it. I don't respond to You preacher, what are you gonna do if I write you a letter? I'm not gonna do anything about it. If it's the debate, you'll never hear from me again. I'm not gonna waste my time nor my breath. I know what I believe, I'm not gonna let I've had men try to change me. I've had men try to change the ministry. I've had men try to change the radio ministry. I've had men try to change the music that we play and the, and, and, and the things that we do. Well, I've had people, listen, I'm not going to let the people dictate what I preach. You can give $1,000 today, but I'm going to preach the same thing tomorrow. You say, well, if I give enough money, he'll change on the gospel pulpit and preach the way I want him to. No, I won't. No. You've got to study. It gets you an appetite to study the Bible. Study, ladies, you ought to study the Bible. Not just preachers, young men, young lady, you ought to study the Bible. And I'll tell you what I did. Before I announced my call to preach, and it was a very serious thing to me to be called to be a God's man. It's a very, I'm going to say that again, it's a very serious thing to me to be called to be God's man. And before I announced my call to preach in October of 1984, I got my Bible down, and I read the qualifications of a preacher to see if I could fit those qualifications. Now, some of you men are disqualified from preaching the Word of God. And the problem is you've never took time to read those qualifications. All you've studied them, and you've, you've put things uh, there that's not there, and you, you want to take it back in, in the Greek. I've got nothing wrong with looking up in the Greek, but I'm going to tell you something. If you use the Greek to justify changing the Bible, then throw the Greek down and forget it and use the Bible. Amen. We have an English translation. Amen. And uh, listen, somebody said, when I go by the original Greek and Hebrew, well, you don't have that. You don't have it. All you got is the English Bible to go by. Amen. Now, I'm not saying not be enlightened, and I'm not saying being ignorant, but today, men like me uh, passed over and looked at as ignorant. Well, you can look at him. Paul said he was a uh, outcast, or uh, uh, I believe, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 he, in other words, the whole world has looked at him. Well, here's the thing about it. Study your Bible. Somebody said if you locked a man in a room and gave him a King James Bible for 30 days and fed him three meals a day and gave him nothing but a King James Bible and a concordance, he'd come out being a fundamental independent tithing Baptist. I don't know if that's true or not, but I know this. I know what I believe, and I know why I believe. I know what I believe about heaven. I know what I believe about the, uh, uh, you know, people argue, are you, are you, are you post-tribulation or pre-tribulation or uh, all millennialist? All that? I know what I believe about that. I know what the Bible teaches about that. I'm leaving here in the rapture of the church. There's going to be seven years of tribulation, and I'm coming back with the Lord on the water. I know what I believe about that. I know what I believe about the devil. I believe he's a deceiver. The Bible calls him a murderer. The Bible calls him a liar. The Bible calls him that old serpent, the devil. I know what I believe about him. And by the way, I know what I believe about Jesus Christ. Somebody said, well, are you one of these uh, easy-believing fellows? Well, I, I know what I believe about salvation. I believe, it, I, I believe you can get saved in two minutes. But I believe the Spirit of the Lord must be convicting that sinner before he gets saved. Amen. But I'm all for taking the gospel and giving it to people and getting people saved. You see, I've studied, and you need to study the Bible, not just what your, well, my church believes this, not what your church believes. Baptists believe some things I don't believe. It's not what your, it's not what your, well, my preacher believes this, not what your preacher believes. What do you believe? What is the Bible? What do you say? What do you say? Where do you stand on things? I know people get convictions because their preacher gets them, and then when he leaves, they'll get a different set of convictions. And I've learned over the years the basics of the faith, and I've had a few of those convictions, by the way, along the way. And I've got them and dropped them and got them and dropped them because some preacher preached them. You know, people feel pressured to go with the crowd. The longer I live, I don't go with the crowd. I just go with the Lord. Amen. Well, meditate in your Bible. Study your Bible. The Bible said in 2 Timothy chapter number 2, verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know, I believe, I believe that Mary probably went back and studied some on what Jesus was saying to her. You know, Mary, Mary took a great opportunity there. She did. She took a great opportunity there. She, uh, uh, Martha's in there serving, clanging the dishes. And Mary's in there listening to Jesus. I don't know what he's teaching on. Maybe he's teaching on prayer. Maybe he's teaching on revival. Maybe he's teaching on giving. I don't know what he's teaching on, but it was good, whatever it was. And Mary, Mary was hearing his word. She was sitting at his feet. She had an appetite for the Bible. Now listen, you can get saved and never have an appetite for God's Word. You can. You, you can live your life. You can be so full of the world. 
You'll never have an appetite for the Bible. But I'll tell you something. I believe the American people are going to stand before God more than any other country. We've got our phones. We've got our Bible programs. I mean, the Bible is very accessible. Not long ago, they had a project down in Grenada to get Bibles down to the nation of Grenada, a half a million dollar project. And when they brought them in there, I understand that the Secretary of Education on the island of Grenada said, there's one requirement for you folk getting these Bibles in here. And they said, what is it? And they said, they must be King James Bibles. See, they speak English in Grenada. Let me tell you something. That's, that's a big deal. Somebody said, I don't make a big deal out of that. Well, you ought to. It's a big deal. Amen. Now, let me move on. You ought to study your Bible. Amen. You ought, you ought to meditate in your Bible. Number three, what about reading your Bible? Now, I thought about this one, and, and I had to think about it. I had to pray about it. And I said, Lord, is there really any Scripture in the Bible for reading the Bible? It'll surprise you what I found. I'm going to show it to you here in just a minute. Now, this first verse I'm going to read to you dealt with public reading. And that's the verse I used to use all, all the time. And, and, uh, but there are better verses as far as putting it in context about reading your Bible. But 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, Till I come, Paul writing to Timothy, give attendance uh, to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Uh, well, that's good. But I thought, Lord, that's public reading. And it was. And what happened back in those days, everybody didn't have a copy of the Bible. And so they would stand up and read the Bible publicly. Now, there's something about reading the Bible that will clean you. I recommend to you, now everybody's got a different method, but I recommend reading your Bible through once a year, every year. I recommend that. And I believe you'll be a great Christian if you'll read your Bible. I really believe you'll be a great, because you'll be clean. John said, now you're clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Now in the book of Acts chapter number 8, there's an Ethiopian eunuch. He's lost, he's religious, he's lost, he's heading back to his country. And Philip had just finished a great revival over in Samaria. And God told Philip, said, you join yourself to that chariot. And said, uh, and here's what happened. Acts chapter number 8, verse number 28. Now this is the Ethiopian eunuch was, was, the Bible said, was returning and sitting in his chariot. Read Isaiah the prophet. What about that? And then, I won't go on with that, but Philip took that scripture and preached Jesus to him, and he got saved. You know what he's doing? Just sitting there reading the Bible. He's just sitting there reading. Then Jesus made this remark in Matthew chapter 12, verse number 3. But he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was and hungered, and uh, they that were with him? He's talking about David eating the showbread at, at uh, the, the tabernacle when David went to uh, him elect the priest. He said, have you not read? Now see, when you read the Bible, the word read means to know again. In other words, our minds don't comprehend everything. Every year when I read my Bible through, as, as if I do, and I've, I've neglected some years, but every year if I start reading my Bible through, I think, oh yeah, the Bible says that. I know it again. Noah building the ark. You go over to uh, Exodus and the children of Israel and the ten plagues, then crossing the Red Sea, and then give the giving of the law, and uh, then Joshua, Judges, and Ruth, which are great books, and Samuel, and then you get your kings and, and all that, and then they go to captivity, and then you go to the New Testament, and Jesus is, I mean, all the way through the Bible, it's new to you every year. You ought to read your Bible, amen? In uh, Matthew chapter number uh, uh, 12, verse number 5, Jesus said, Or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days, the, the priest in the temple profane the Sabbath days, uh, profane the Sabbath and are blameless. You know what? The key there is, have you not read? Everything Jesus is doing, he said, have you not read? Matthew chapter 9, talking about marriage, verse number 4, and he answered and said unto them, have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? There's a lot of people need to read that today. It's in the Bible. That's why the devil hates your Bible. Have you not read it? You see, the devil don't want you to read the Bible. The devil will tell you, well, uh, the pastor reads the Bible, and he'll tell me what I need to say. No, 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 no. You don't need to be in something like that. If a pastor said to me, close your Bible, and I'll just preach to you, I'd be leery of that man. I want my Bible. I want to think for myself. Some preachers don't give people liberty to think for themselves because they want control over them, you see. 
I'm not going to sit in a church like that. I've sat in plenty of them over the years and my my years of being saved and, and uh, preachers, and, and I'm not going to do that. I I, I don't want uh, nobody controlling my life. I want God to control. Now, wait a minute. Hold the mule a minute. I believe in respecting the pastor, and I've got a good preacher. And if my pastor come to me today and he needed something or want me to do something, I'd be glad to do that for him. But my pastor is not like that. He's not a controlling man. I appreciate that. Amen. But if you read the Bible, you'll know the knowledge for yourself, you see. And knowledge is power. You, you know what you believe. Matthew 21 and verse number 16. And he said unto them, Hearest thou what these say? And he's talking about those babies praising God in the temple. And Jesus said unto, him, unto them, Yea, have ye never read uh, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings? Uh, thou hast perfected praise. Now, I don't know this for a fact. You know, I know that Jesus went into the temple in Luke 4. And they handed him the scroll and he opened it to Isaiah and read from it. Now, I believe, now of course he's God, so he knows everything. But I believe that Jesus Christ probably spent, and from 12 years old to 33 uh, years old, the life of Jesus is silent. We don't know what he did. And, uh, but I believe that he read the Scriptures. Although he was God, I believe he read the Scriptures. And I believe you and I ought to read the Scriptures. You and I ought to read the Scriptures. Not just study, but read. You say, well, I spend most of my time studying. Well, well, listen, there's a such thing as the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. Now, studying will kill you if you do it all the time. But you've got to study, read, meditate. You've got to do it all. There's a balance. You need to have a balance in your life. All right? And Matthew... Uh, uh, twenty-one forty-two. Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same is become the head of the corner. And this is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. You know what? Everything those Pharisees and all that would come back to Jesus and say, Have you not read? You see, a man that never reads the Scriptures, he won't know the Scriptures. Matthew 22, 3, he said, uh, But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, he's talking about the Sadducees there. You see, everything in this Bible, I believe there's an answer for it, and reading the Bible is one of the greatest forms of knowing the Bible. Well, you need to meditate in your Bible. And get your Bible down. Find out what it said. Then there's a time you need to study out things. You need to study. Compare verses to verses. Uh, compare commentaries. See what men have said. And then there's a time to read. All right? Let me give you another one. Fourthly, there's a time to hide the Word of God in your heart. There's a time to memorize. You say, now, preacher, I, I have a problem with that. You say, preacher, I just can't memorize Scripture. I, I've got a, I got a problem trying to memorize. You know, I thought about this uh, just a minute ago, sitting here. Mary heard the Word of God, right? I believe Mary meditated on what she heard. I believe Mary probably went back and studied, probably got hold of the, uh, the, the Mosaical Law and studied a little bit. You know what Mary could have done? Uh, Mary could have started reading. She could have started reading. And then, I believe Mary probably started hiding that Word in her heart. Brother, I'll tell you what, it'd be amazing. You, we remember all kind of codes and things. Wouldn't it be good if we hid the Word? Not just in our head, though. And I do think that's a lot of young people's problem. Listen, you can memorize 40 scriptures in the Christian school, but memorizing the scripture alone will not, will not do you any good. A lot of people have it in their mind. I can quote, I can quote John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. I can quote that. I quote John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. There are several other scriptures I quote in the Bible, and that's good about quoting it. But let me remind you, the devil can quote scripture. But the key to Psalm 119, verse number 11 says, Thy word, thy word, that's the key. Now, thy word, not somebody's devotional. And I ain't got nothing wrong with devotionals if they're done right. But thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Where did he hide the word? Not in his mind, but in his heart. You see, it's not so much memorizing the Scripture, but if you hid the word in your heart. You see, you're not always going to have a Bible. You're going to be somewhere one day, 
And the devil's going to tempt you, young man, with a, with a woman that's not your wife. And I mean, that's going to happen. It happens to every preacher that's ever been called. I believe that's one of the main tools of the devil is somebody else's wife, somebody in the church. The devil's going to tempt you with that. Now, if you haven't been to the book of Proverbs and read what the Bible says about adultery and read what the Bible says the end of adultery will be, that that, that man's in, he, he's going he's gonna to be just uh, uh, for by means of a whorish woman, a man that's brought to a piece of bread. If you've never read that, if you've never read, uh, can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned with fire? When I was a young man, I put that in my heart. Not just in my head, I put it in my heart. And brother, it has kept me. It's kept me all these years and other verses in the Bible pertain to other things. I've read what the Bible said about things. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Matthew 6, 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. You see, a lot of people, a lot of preachers get, if, if women don't get them, things get them. You say, preacher, what is things? Uh, five vacations a year away from your church, leaving your people. Well, the preacher's got to relax. Well, some preachers spend their whole life relaxing. Amen. It's not a time to relax, boy. It's time to fight the fight of faith. Amen. And take some time off. Rest a little bit, but don't rest all the time. Uh, somebody said, I need a hobby. Well, I don't know about that. Amen. Amen. You need, you need the Lord. You need to be working for the Lord. There's a lot of things you could do. Write books. Sing songs. Write songs. Amen. Do something for God. Uh, make your life useful so that when you come down to the end of the way, that you've left something for your children and your grandchildren. Don't just leave, well, Paul was the pastor of the church. Don't leave that. Leave a heritage. Leave, leave something for your kids. Leave a book. or uh, leave, leave an outline or leave something that you've done. But hide, and the only way you'll ever be able to do that is hide that word in your heart. The only, way, the only thing to keep you preaching all these years is hide that word in your heart. See, because I hear it about things. I mean, listen, pleasure has just never been my thing. Money's never been my thing. And the more you get of it, the more you'll want of it. Amen. I'm not saying go be poor, and I'm not saying sell everything you got, and I'm not saying don't ever go on vacation. I didn't say that. And I'm not even saying don't have a hobby, but I'll tell you this, if you get busy for the Lord's work, you won't have as much hobbies to do, and you can do something for God. You say, Preacher, you believe in working every day for the Lord? I, I, want, I want to do what I can. I know there's a time to rest. There's a time to come apart. Jesus said that. He said, come apart for a while. That's a period of time. It ain't just five minutes sometimes. Sometimes it'll do you good, preacher. Just take a week off and rest and, and uh, let somebody else handle things. And, and just don't ever get to where you think you're the only man can handle it. I mean, you need to rest. you got to rest. You have to. And, and by the way, for you that are not preachers, preaching is hard work. I, preaching has probably took a toll on me more than I know 40 years. I've averaged preaching at least one time a week for 40 years. And many times I preach more than that a week, and I'm not talking about 10-minute things. I'm talking about 50-minute sermons. And, it, and it'll work on you. It'll tire you out. Sometimes I'm so tired, and it, it'll work. But sometimes I need rest. Sometimes I've just took a day, and I've said, I'm going to stay home today, and I'm going to rest and get my mind just mentally refreshed and my body refreshed, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I've hit, you have to hide this old Word of God in your heart. you got to hide what the Bible says in your heart about bitterness and unforgiveness. You know, the Bible talked about a root of bitterness springing up in him. Boy, a lot of preachers come down the end of the way, and they didn't hide these scriptures in their heart, and they got bitter. I'm talking to some preachers right now, and I love you. God be with you, and God restore you. But you've been so bitter over the last few years. You say, preacher, you don't realize what they did to me and my family and my wife. Let me tell you something. You think my wife ain't been attacked? You think I ain't been attacked? But I ain't jumped out there. Now, by the way, I'm not going to let somebody hit my wife. Amen. I'm not going to do that. But if somebody says something, I'm not going to be one of these fellows jump out there and say, oh, you said that about my wife. And I'll tell you what, I'll box you. No, 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 no. When you do that, you're going to lose your ministry. Listen, let men and women, you better realize you're going to be attacked as a preacher and a preacher's wife. you got to be tougher than that. And this old men tell you, well, I'll defend my family no matter what. Well, I'm going to tell you what, you, you get in the flesh, you'll lose your ministry. A man told me a story one time. He said there was this preacher. He had a good church, had a good ministry, and something happened in that church. I don't know what happened. But that man got in his pulpit on Sunday morning and challenged those people to a fight. 
And when he did, God took his hand off that man. Let me tell you something, brother. I, I've come down the road. I've been preaching 45 years now. I love my wife. Other than Lord Jesus Christ, I love my wife more than anything in the world. I'm not going to let anybody run over. But I'm going to tell you something. It ain't, it, ain't, it ain't about me and my wife. It's about Jesus Christ. Brother, they crucified Jesus. Brother, they, they spit in his face. Brother, they put a crown of thorns on his head. The Bible said he was rejected. Do you know what rejection is? Rejection is one of the most hurtful things in life. You know, I've been rejected. I've, I, I've been rejected for things to participate in. People say, no, you, you can't participate with us because, you know, they were more worldly than I was, so they wouldn't let me participate. I've been rejected as a preacher somewhat because I preach the truth and because I stand. I'm not the only tin can rattling the alley, but because I do preach the truth, I, I feel that I've been rejected somewhat in, 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 in some places that uh, other men get places to preach. And I think I've been rejected because of my status in life. I'm, I'm poor. I think I've been rejected because of my education factor, that I didn't get more education. I think probably all that has played into rejection. And I, I've had to deal with rejection. I know what it is. I've never been in the club of anybody's club. I, I've seen other preachers. They, they're in a clique of preachers, and boy, they all get I've never been in nobody's clique. Nobody's ever wanted me in their clique. I do have the respect of men across this country, and I appreciate that. And there are men that I can pick the phone up right now and call and talk to them and and I, I, I thank God for that. And they're good to me. And they love me. And I love them. And I'm not having a pity party. I'm just telling you facts. But let me tell you something about that. I've hid the Word of God in my heart. And I've realized that Jesus was rejected. And boy, this thing of bitterness, you better hide that verse in your heart, preacher, about this root of bitterness. Bitterness will get you. I tell you, bitterness will get you. You'll get bitter before you ever even know it. Oh, you get bitter at somebody that done you wrong. You say, preacher, uh, you young men. You say, well, I get done wrong in the ministry. You sure will. Why, you may have a nice suit on right now, young man. You may have just come out of Bible college and you got your Bible and everybody loves you. That won't last long. Uh, they used to talk about taking you ch taking a church. They talk about the honeymoon period. Everything go be good for about six months. And then, boy, you get to preaching on something and, boy, somebody don't like it. And then somebody else don't like it. And then you got trouble on your hands. Amen. Let me tell you something. I, I, I tell you this right now. Uh, you know, I, I've had uh, people that, I'll be honest with you, I, I, I think they hated me. I think some folk would have drove me out of the preaching business if they could have. But God put me in it. Amen. But here's the thing about that. Here's the thing about that. God, amen, God, I've hid some, some Bible in my heart just to keep on going for God. I, I've read Demas. You know, the Bible said Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Let me say this. I've had some good friends in life. I've had some great preacher friends that's let me preach in their churches. I thank God for it. Amen. I thank God for some good friends I've had along the way. But you know, I sure wouldn't want to quit on God. And I, I have uh, made that uh, uh, commitment to God. I, I, I want to stay with Him. Well, I, I think about that. You know, I, I've tried to hide that in my heart, these verses about quitting on the Lord, because I'm afraid of the chastening of God. You see, some people don't believe, oh, God won't do anything to you. God will do something to you, friend. God will do something. Yes, you, you, you've got a, a, a will inside you. But let me tell you one thing. You're still God's if you're saved. You belong to God. You've got the seal of God on you. And if you think God's going to let His kids run around and do anything, you're wrong. Now, you may have let your kids run around and got involved in everything, but I tell you what, God don't raise His kids that way. My daddy never did get a switch and whoop nobody else's kids, but I sure got some whippings. Amen. And I'll tell you something, brother. You ain't never had a whipping until God gets a hold of you. You ain't never had a whip until you have the chastisement of God upon you. So I'm afraid, amen, I'm afraid to quit. I really am, amen. The, the Paul said, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. You know, the old devil's come to me many times, 40 years of preaching, and said, you ought to just quit. Say, nobody listening to you, nobody believes like you believe anymore, nobody preaches like you preach, you might as well just quit, you ought to quit. And I think about that. You know, I can give you, I can give you a lot of reasons why I can't quit. Number one, the men that went before me. How in the world am I going to stand before Paul and Abraham and Isaac and uh, Isaiah, who they said was sawed to death with a wooden saw, and Luke hanged in an olive tree, and Peter crucified upside down, and John boiled in oil, and I'm going to stand there and say, I got my feelings hurt, and I quit and went to the house and started playing video games and watching baseball. Well, I can't quit because of the young people. How many young people across America have come to me and asked me in different states and different places, have asked me or across parts of the nation anyway, say, would you sign my Bible? 
Would you sign? Would you put your name? Mama? How in the world could I be a quitter? Uh, you got to hide this word in your heart, not in your head, but in your heart. Have an appetite for the Word of God. Get it in you. Get in you early, at an early age, what the Bible says about quitting. Don't you ever be a quitter on God. Don't you ever take a second uh, a back seat in the ministry. I made my mind up. I, 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 if it meant waiting about marriage, if it meant not ever getting married, I wasn't taking a back seat. And I didn't. I married the right wife. But you boys, sometimes you get in a hurry. You preach the boys about getting married. You think you got to get married, and you got to get married. Let me tell you something. If she ain't got a heartbeat for what you got, listen, don't you dare settle for second when you could be first. And don't settle for some position. You know, don't settle. I, I, now, there's nothing wrong being a man's assistant pastor. But God never wanted me to be uh, in that role as a young preacher. Somebody said, hey, he just never did. He never did open the door for me. Matter of fact, I was turned down for a job one time in a church. And, and, and the thing is, uh, you know, I had, uh, 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 you know, um, girls. I'd be, I'd be talking to some girl, and I thought, well, this is the right girl. And they wouldn't have the heart. They'd want me to do something else in the ministry. And God didn't want me to do that. And here's the thing about it. I want to do what God wants me to do. And so I hid that in my heart. The Paul said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. He said, I've kept the faith. I finished the course. I want to finish the course like Paul. And the only way I can finish in the will of God is to be in the will of God. Today, I was thinking about this. I was sitting here a while ago, and I got some young people listening, so I'm going to tell you something. God's not going to crash, bang, boom, just give you the plan for your life one day. You're not going to wake up and have some funny experience and, and, and a voice, this is God. And this is the plan for you for the rest of your life. God does not do that. A man preached a message, one of the greatest messages I ever heard. You don't really see it recorded much. You don't hear it much, but it's a great message. On man's ways are God's steps. Man devises his steps from his, from his own heart, his own ways from his own heart. But God devises a man's steps. You see, the Bible said, the psalmist said, Order thou my steps in, in thy word. And let not any iniquity have dominion over me. I may not quote it word for word. But let me tell you something. God orders the steps. And you get an appetite for this word of God. And you hide it in your heart. What you do is you live for God every day. You don't tell you how to be in the will of God 10 years from right now. You be in the will of God today. Pray. Read your Bible. Study today. Today. And you'll be in the will of God tomorrow. You say, but I'm waiting on some big revelation from God. It won't happen. God just move you step by step. You'll meet somebody today that might be back in your life 20 years from now. I've met people years ago or heard of people 20 and 30 years ago and then meet them 20 and 30 years later and they would be a great influence in my life. I'm thinking of a dear preacher friend of mine. I rode by church one time and saw a sign and had this man's name on it. Now, I didn't meet that man. I heard about the man never did get to meet him. And I don't know, it was, uh, it was uh, at least 10, it was at least 20. Uh, good night, it was probably, uh, well, what, maybe 15 years later, uh, 15, 20 years later, I got to meet that guy. I got, well, then I got to talk to him. Then I finally got to meet him. It's probably it's over, over 20, 20 years, uh, closer to 25, 30 years before I ever got to meet the guy. Let me tell you something. And he's been a great influence on me down through these last years. Been a great influence on me. Hide that word in your heart. Now, you can go to the school, and I'm not, I'm not against Christian schools, and I'm not against learning Scripture. Please don't misunderstand me. But a lot of you go to school, and you pack the Scripture in your mind. Well, you can put baseball statistics in your mind. You can put, you can put racing statistics in your mind. You can put, you can put uh, 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 science statistics in your mind. You can put health statistics in your mind. But get the Word of God in your heart. Do you have an appetite for the Word? The Bible said that Mary said at Jesus' feet and heard His Word. You know, from the time He came in that house, she started listening to the Bible. She started listening to what Jesus had to say. I'm interested in what Jesus has to say. Ain't you? This morning I was praying, and I got my Bible. You ever prayed and read your Bible at the same time? I got my Bible, and I was praying. And God showed me things from the Bible in my prayer when I was praying from the Word of God. I want to tell you something, brother. This Word of God's my comfort. This Word of God's my compass. This Word of God's my guide. This Word of God is my checkbook. I can have anything from God I want, as long as it's in the Bible, as long as it's in God's will. This Bible's my, my source of strength and help every day. I want to ask you, do you have an appetite for the Bible? 
You know, I later talked to that preacher that gave me that Bible in 1979. And he said to me, he said, Ricky, he said, I saw that God had His hand on you. How about you preachers? Have you ever done anything to help the young people in your church? Don't just be the preacher and you don't pay attention to the young people. I let the youth workers handle that. No, don't do that. You need to be personal with your... My pastor is so personal with the young people in our church. I appreciate that. That's a real blessing. He'll talk to them. They'll come up to him, talk to him. I like it. I've seen it happen. I love that. That's great. The pastor ought to have a relationship with the young people as, as, as well as the old. I want you young people to love me. And I want you to realize Brother Ricky is trying to... I want you older people to love me and help me. I want you older preachers to help me. And if I'm doing something wrong, I want you to tell me about it. I want to be... I want to be the best preacher God's got. Now I ask you today, do you have an appetite for the Word? If it hadn't been for that preacher, 1979, they had an interest in me, I don't know where I'd be today. Let's pray. Father, help somebody get an appetite for the Word of God and help this uh, message to go forward. Use it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.